Simple fire and movement tactics win the fight. This principle cannot be stressed too much. It is the one thing that will break a stalemate in battle. Whenever a unit is stopped by fire, some part of it must promptly return the fire, while some part initiates movement. I think you'll find that many fundamentals of modern small unit tactics are both universal and relatively timeless, as there are only so many ways to go about it. But each nation in each time period will have its own idiosyncrasies. With that in mind, this video will cover one specific nation's army at one specific time in history, and the terminology herein will appropriately reflect that focus. For the sake of simplicity, this video will feature a squad operating by itself. While ordinarily squads attacked as part of the platoon effort, and the platoon as part of the company, and so on, We'll start with our demonstration squad here leaving its forward assembly area during a phase of the attack known as the approach march. While battle may have been chaos, there were defined steps to offensive action. The attack transitioned between various set stages, and progress was marked by reaching successive phase lines. The squad's attack began when it crossed the line of departure, commonly abbreviated LD. During a coordinated attack, the squad might first occupy an attack position the last covered and concealed position before reaching the LD. For those wondering, cover provided protection from enemy fire, whereas concealment provided protection from enemy observation. So a hill provides both cover and concealment, whereas a smokescreen provides concealment but no cover. Uh, I suppose bulletproof glass is one of the few things that could provide cover but not concealment. Anyway, an attack position was the last place to finish checks, finalize orders, and designate rallying points before all hell broke loose. Rallying points, also confusingly referred to in some manuals as assembly points, were defined as a place which a unit commander chooses for assembling and reorganizing his troops after an action in preparation for further operations. A rallying point could be to the rear of the squad, such as a location where a patrol could regroup if it was ambushed, or uh, it could be to the squad's front, uh, where its members could regroup if, uh, for example, they were scattered uh, during a river crossing. From the assembly area or attack position, a squad passed through the line of departure at their assigned point of departure, employing one of the uh, tactical formations I discussed in my previous video, ordinarily a column or diamond. When advancing in the presence of the enemy, the squad is preceded by its scouts who seek out the enemy and prevent surprise. Scouts precede the squad at such distance that it will not be subjected to surprise small arms fire. To cause the scouts to precede their unit, the command is, Scouts out. If the location of the enemy was not known, scouts tried to discover them without being discovered first themselves. Upon spotting the enemy, a scout signaled enemy in sight. Uh, from some type of concealed position, it would have been unhealthy to stand up and hold a rifle over your head in full view of enemy personnel. If the scouts were detected first, things happened quickly. According to doctrine, when scouts were fired upon, the squad immediately took cover and the scouts returned fire with tracer ammunition to point out the enemy positions. There was a practiced manner for GIs to hit the ground and once there, roll over sideways into a firing position. Taking cover. Rolling to escape gunfire because the enemy aims where you drop. The squad leader made a quick estimate of the situation. He had to decide whether or not the enemy position could be reduced by his squad alone. Generally, a single squad would not attack an entrenched enemy squad unless complete surprise was assured, as it was about the only advantage they had. A similar sized defending force enjoyed several advantages of cover, concealment, firepower, and uh, pre-selected and cleared fields of fire. An attacker, on the other hand, had to advance exposed above the ground and couldn't bring all of his weapons to bear while he was moving. Other conditions being equal, any given force is markedly stronger in defense than in offense. If any force attacks an equal force in an organized position of its own choosing, the repulse of the attacker is virtually certain, unless superior leadership or some favorable circumstance offsets the inherent advantage of the defense. It has often been held that a combat superiority of at least 2 to 1 is necessary to justify offensive action. Accepting this as a general premise, it is still true that the natural advantages of the defense may be counterbalanced by the advantages of the initiative and of surprise. Fortunately, this video can continue, because our intrepid squad leader has decided he can take the enemy MG with his squad alone. He has what was called an adequate superiority of force. Uh, thus begins a new phase of the attack, the firefight. The squad leader needed to bring his squad up where it could most effectively engage the enemy, 
this may or may not have been on the line of scouts, as they could have been caught out in a terrible position. But the purpose of the firefight was to gain fire superiority. At the first firing position, the squad seeks to gain fire superiority over the enemy to its front. Fire superiority is gained by subjecting the enemy to fire of such accuracy and intensity that his fire becomes so inaccurate or so reduced in volume as to be ineffective. Once gained, it must be maintained. The squad and smaller groups must be trained to place a large volume of accurate fire upon probable enemy locations and indistinct or concealed targets such as enemy machine guns or small groups. The squad and smaller groups must be trained to apply such fire quickly upon order or signal of their leader and in appropriate circumstances to apply it without such order. During the firefight, the primary duty of the squad leader is to place the fire of his squad on the target. Doctrinally, the squad leader uh, fires only in emergency, or when he considers the firepower to be gained by his firing outweighs the necessity for his close control of the squad. It seems it would be relatively easy to classify any firefight you were personally in at the time as some level of emergency. As with everything, there was a prescribed way to go about this. Each member of the squad fires his first shot on that portion of the target corresponding generally to his position in the squad. He then distributes his next shots to the right and left of his first shot, covering that part of the target on which he can deliver accurate fire without having to change position. The portion of the target which one man can cover will depend upon the range and the position of the firer. Frequently, each man will be able to cover the entire target with accurate fire. This should be done whenever possible. Fire is not limited to points within the target known to contain the enemy. On the contrary, all men space their shots so that no portion of the target remains unhit. From a position best suited to provide support, the automatic rifleman distributes his fire over the entire target or on any target which will best support the advance of other members of the squad. This method of fire distribution is employed without command. You'll read bogus claims floating around the internet that GIs back then were only trained to fire at targets they could clearly see, but as you can clearly see, that's demonstrably false. As the basic field manual for the M1 plainly puts it, members of the squad must be trained to place a heavy fire on the designated area even though no specific targets are visible. After all, it's not the man you see high above the grass who is going to cause you the trouble. It's the man low in the grass, along the line, that you can't see at all. This type of fire was known as distributed fire, as opposed to concentrated fire, which was fire delivered against point targets. Targets were also called out in a prescribed manner. A complete target designation includes the following elements. Range, how far to look. Direction, where to look. Description, what to look for. These elements are always given with a slight pause between elements. The manual gives examples such as Range 425, left front, sniper at base of dead tree, or range 500, right front, watch my tracer, machine gun. The manual also mentions that distinct and fleeting targets can be pointed out with extreme brevity using something as simple as those men. Frequently, the squad leader will be able to designate the target to only one or two members of his squad. Therefore, each member of the squad must be taught to assist in designating the targets to the other members of the squad team. At times, the entire target designation will be furnished by the scouts to other members of the squad as they arrive in the vicinity. The squad leader may engage two targets by placing a number of riflemen under the command of the assistant squad leader, directing him to engage one target while he, the squad leader, engages the other target with the automatic riflemen and other members of the squad. It could also be the other way around, with the assistant squad leader in charge of the BAR team while the squad leader commanded the riflemen, uh, whichever circumstances demanded. Fire control was aided by arm and hand signals. People may have an impression that arm and hand signals are some sort of modern tactical invention, or that their only role was to facilitate stealth, but they were often necessary because the battlefield was a very noisy place. Basic voice commands were supplemented by these signals. And there were no squad radios, so if soldiers wanted to communicate outside of voice range but within visual range, it was a simple way to do that. All GIs would be familiar with a few dozen gestures, many of which haven't changed since and were already old at the time. Some have remained exactly the same for many generations. Others have evolved slightly over the decades, but as you can see, their lineage is plainly evident. And they go back further than these illustrations. There are descriptions of them in 19th century drill manuals. The entire squad usually holds its fire until the range to the target is 500 yards or less. However, under favorable conditions, the automatic rifle is effective against enemy troops or areas known to contain enemy groups at ranges between 500 yards and 1,000 yards. 
that's uh, roughly between 457 and 914 meters. Other training aids flatly state, rifle fire is of little effect at ranges beyond 400 yards. That's about uh, 366 meters, as fire beyond that was considered ineffective and therefore a waste of ammo. A defender with a decent stockpile of ammunition could open fire at a greater distance, but attacking riflemen could only carry so much ammunition, and uh, they were going to need it at later stages. With that in mind, the squad leader permits his squad to open fire only when fire action is necessary to cover a further advance. So in combat, the squad's usual method of advance was fire and movement, which was also known at the time as fire and maneuver. Both of these terms were used interchangeably, and they were both simply defined in uh, TM-2205 as a method of attack in which the advancing element is supported and covered by the gunfire of other elements. The attacker now endeavors to establish fire superiority over the defender by use of all of his weapons. Under protection of this fire, in taking advantage of the cover afforded by the terrain, the rifle units advance to successive firing positions, closer and closer to the enemy. This procedure is called advancing the attack. By fire and maneuver, each attacking unit endeavors to arrive as close as possible to the enemy. Unless supporting weapons or other units are able to maintain fire superiority without help from the squad, enough members of the squad must remain in position and continue the fire to maintain it. The automatic rifle's capacity for putting down a large volume of fire makes it especially useful for this purpose. Meanwhile, other members of the squad move forward, take up firing positions closer to the enemy, and by their fire cover the forward movement of the rearward members. By this combination of fire and maneuver, the squad advances close enough to capture the hostile position by assault. A basic procedure was to split the squad in two, as written about in a 1944 Army Life article about the infantry school. The squad leader moves his squad forward to its objective by advancing the rifle team and the BAR team alternately, with one team covering the other team's rushing advances. FM 710 notes that the squad increases its rate of fire during periods when any part of it or of an adjacent squad is in movement, and that complete fire superiority is required for men to advance over open ground in the face of an unbeaten enemy. Rushes by individuals or small groups are used to move from cover to cover across short stretches of terrain. However, in very open areas, an advance will usually necessitate overwhelming fire superiority with consequent longer bounds between firing positions. To leave a covered position, make a short rush, and drop into a position which affords no protection from enemy ground fire serves only to increase losses without commensurate gain. So, fire and maneuver within the squad could be conducted with one half of the squad supporting the other. A Silver Star citation for a Sergeant Bobby G. Mays serving in the 80th Infantry Division shows this method in use. The squad leader became a casualty whereupon Sergeant Mays assumed command of the squad and directed the resumption of the attack. He divided the squad into a base of fire and maneuvering force, and by this strategy accomplished the capture of the fortified position and 35 prisoners. The Infantry Journal article, Battle Drill for Squads and Platoon, says of the scouts, This team usually becomes part of the base of fire in the attack, but the situation may require the squad leader to order it to join the maneuver element. An accompanying illustration shows the Able bubble merging with the Baker bubble uh, during a squad attack. But the training material points out that a 12-man squad could be divided into two six-man teams, three four-man teams, four three-man teams, or six two-man teams. So a fire maneuver could be carried out by pairs, as illustrated in this account of an attack in France. The squad formed a skirmish line at the edge of the woods in preparation for crossing the pasture that sloped gently upward to Moncourt. We moved out with two men running forward and hitting the ground to provide fire cover, while two more moved up. In its simplest form, it could be done by two men covering each other, as described by Michael Builder in his book Foot Soldier for Patton. Condra and I moved up along the main street using the buddy system, one of us on the right side of the street and the other on the left. I took cover in a doorway or behind an object and watched, ready to provide cover fire, as Condra moved up half a block, then he returned the favor as I moved up. Stalwart enemy resistance may require more men to cover the advance of fewer men. At times, it may be necessary for men to advance singly. At such times, the squad or team leader indicates the objective in the men or men who are to make the movement. On the signal forward, each man then picks his route to his objective and moves out taking advantage of all existing cover. The squad leader normally follows the first two or three men in order to direct their advance and keep control. The assistant squad leader stays behind to make sure that the rest of the squad follows in turn. 
Now, fire and movement is a simple procedure on its face, but it required a lot of training to be carried out effectively. In training, complicated squad and platoon problems must be avoided. They are not worth the time they require to run. Simple, direct fire and movement problems, designed so that the leaders must act quickly and maintain control of their units, must be practiced again and again. According to the rather redundantly titled Leadership for American Army Leaders, Nothing is more important. Battle drill which teaches in detail the SOP for fire and maneuver cannot be practiced too often in training. A squad leader, for example, confronting enemy fire decides instantly, left flanking, and the order, passed along from man to man, automatically goes into execution with a well-practiced rhythm. The BAR team fixes the enemy position with a base of fire. The rest of the squad infiltrates to the left by way of the best cover each man moving rhythmically according to his number in the squad. When the rest of the squad has thus taken up the fire and formed a base, the BAR team ceases fire and moves around to the left behind the base rifleman and extends the flank, gaining a position closer on the enemy flank and again going into action. This fire and maneuver, continuing automatically on the initiative of the two elements of the squad, and moving generally in a left flanking direction until the final assault, is a technique which is largely a matter of rhythmic leapfrogging a technique perfected by long practice. In an environment of constant grinding attrition and an endless stream of fresh replacements, this otherwise simple idea could be difficult to properly execute. A 1944 article in the Monthly Infantry Journal reminded small unit leaders that it's up to you to coordinate them, continuing to direct fire and movement simultaneously, making them cover each other's advance. In the heat of battle, it has frequently been observed that the command to move forward is often followed by a surge of men all wanting to rise and advance as a wave. Either that, or they lie still, a ripple of fire building up until it sounds like the firing line at Camp Perry, and nobody moves. Fire and movement was one of the more hazardous phases of the attack, due to the fire going in both directions, from in front and from behind a moving soldier. An infantry school mailing list article from July of 1944 detailing the patrol close combat course, which was run with a team of four in two buddy pairs, states that a soldier must at all times consider the safety of his teammates, particularly the man with whom he is paired in the buddy system. He must be prepared always to cover his buddy's movements with fire. He must, when firing, be certain that no teammate is in his line of fire. Once members of the squad were close enough to the enemy, the final phase of the attack could be launched, the assault where ground had to physically be taken from the enemy. The assault is delivered on orders, on signal of the platoon leader, or on the initiative of the squad leader. It is delivered at the earliest moment that promises success and without regard to the progress of adjacent squads. The squad approaches the hostile resistance by keeping as close as practicable to the supporting fires. The classic textbook squad attack always had some sort of covered or concealed approach, where the maneuvering element could outflank the enemy, but this was obviously not always the case. But the single envelopment, the old, uh, we'll keep them busy from the front while you go around and hit them on the side, was the goal in a perfect world. One man with the BAR has a firepower equal to five men with the M1 and can pin the enemy down just as effectively. The five riflemen are now free to maneuver. They can come around and try to hit them on the flank. If the base of fire element could occupy its firing position, and the maneuver element could occupy its assault position stealthily, without alerting the enemy, then that was obviously preferred. The scouts, constituting the maneuver element of the BAR team, move forward to establish routes to and select the place for the base of fire. Meanwhile, the rifle team, principal maneuver element of the squad, sets out for the objective, employing route, formations, and methods best suited to the situation. Under favorable conditions, if the squad could close with the enemy undetected, the swift employment of the BAR team may be all that was required to neutralize them. An automatic rifleman who served in the 103rd Division recounted this action near the German border at the end of November of 1944. We had not moved very far when we heard firing from a German machine gun directly below where we were. Our squad scout crawled in that direction and soon called us that way. The machine gun nest was dug into the edge of the grape vineyard in plain view of us who were above them. The squad leader then called me and my team into position and we easily disposed of them. There were two of them and they never knew it hit them. They were firing at troops moving up the valley, C Company. We could now hear a lot of firing by other Germans directly ahead and below us. Following the same procedure as before, we surprised another position and got them before they knew we were there. Sergeant Newis crawled up ahead and looked over the edge of the road. He then raised up into a kneeling position and started firing his rifle. This was not according to his procedure, as he should have called for the BAR team if he spotted something. 
He then flopped down and began frantically waving at me to join him. I knew we were in trouble from the expression on his face. But sometimes the attack needed to be carried straight in, a frontal assault with the squad continuing to fire and move as it pushed straight on through the objective the way it had come. Squad leaders moved their squads into the objective aggressively, regardless of the progress of other squads to the right and left, but they moved their squads through the enemy position by small group rushes, with every move covered by fire of the rest of the squad and platoon. The more enemy resistance is encountered, the shorter the rushes and the smaller the groups. If resistance is very heavy, or if there are serious natural or artificial obstacles, groups have to crawl forward instead of walking or running. The various small arms field manuals illustrated yet another scheme, a pincer attack, in which the core of the BAR team remained in a position to provide fire support, while the remainder of the squad split in two and advanced to alternating firing positions on both flanks simultaneously, each covering the other's advance until either or both were in a position to conduct the final assault. Whichever way they arrived, the maneuver element occupied an assault position, the last covered and concealed position short of the objective, the spot where the final assault would be launched. When the maneuver element is in readiness in its assault position, it suddenly increases its rate of fire to the maximum to force the enemy to keep his head down. This overwhelming volume of fire can last only a few seconds and is the signal for everyone to prepare to rush. The increased rate of fire is immediately taken up by the base of fire and by the supporting weapons. When the fires reach maximum volume, the maneuvering element, if close enough to the enemy, showers his position with grenades. Immediately afterward, all close for the kill. Now, a heavy hail of surprise rifle fire and grenades may just annihilate the enemy outright, but their position still had to be taken underfoot. The assault itself was the most precarious moment of the attack. With the interruption of the highest volume of fire being poured on them, the window was open for the enemy to reman their defenses with purpose. For the safety of the assaulting troops, the base of fire element had to shift their fire. Uh, this could occur when they saw their fire was about to be masked by the leading riflemen, or once those riflemen passed a pre-designated spot on the ground. There were also several emergency means such as flares, colored smoke, uh, tracers fired vertically, suggested as shift fire signals. At that moment it was up to the assaulting riflemen themselves to generate enough fire to maintain fire superiority. One of the ways to do this was assault fire. Uh, this was a bit of a barge-in, guns a blazing approach, a task which was well suited for the semi-automatic M1. Assault fire is fire delivered by a unit during its assault on a hostile position. Automatic riflemen and riflemen with bayonets fixed, all taking full advantage of existing cover such as tanks, boulders, trees, walls, and mounds, advance rapidly toward the enemy and fire as they advance at areas known or believed to be occupied by hostile personnel. Such fire is usually delivered from the standing position and is executed at a rapid rate. So assault fire is both fire and movement provided by a soldier at the same time as he closed the final distance with the enemy. It was not the recommended tactic for dislodging a determined foe, but it was used to rapidly gobble up an objective once the enemy's will had been broken. During the closing phase of the assault, when the enemy are surrendering and resistance is at an end, and when enemy observation from adjacent areas is blanketed by smoke or reduced visibility, an entire unit may rise and move forward at a walk or run in order to occupy its objective fast, mop up, and reorganize. But this is exceptional. As individuals or small groups of assaulting riflemen get close enough to see individual enemy soldiers, they finish them off with point-blank rifle fire or grenades. When enemy emplacements become visible, their firing ports and openings are kept under point-blank fire until someone gets close enough to shoot or throw a grenade into the position. On close approach, additional fragmentation and incendiary grenades are dropped in for good measure. All buildings, caves, or thickets are given the same treatment. Enemy personnel who do not surrender found hiding in holes are promptly shot or bayoneted. Leading riflemen arriving close to the enemy position may fire from the hip for additional fire coverage as they make each forward rush. The assault was also where most manuals of the time from around the world paid lip service to the so-called spirit of the bayonet, as well as the need for defenders to stand their ground against it. But unless you were a Japanese soldier, a bayonet charge was usually not in the cards. It certainly happened, and with a war as enormous as the Second World War, there are plenty of examples to cite. But as a percentage of total assaults carried out, it was exceedingly rare, uh, again with certain exceptions depending on time and theater. For the most part, GIs in Europe thought a bayonet was a can opener that fit on a rifle. But for the Japanese, the spirit of the bayonet was more than a slogan. Tactical and Technical Trends published a translation of a Japanese document titled Land Warfare Tactics to Use Against U.S. and British Forces, which notes, 
The Americans make much of firepower, especially the power of artillery, and lay small stress on bayonet charges. It is bad judgment to fail to use a charge to bring about a final decision. U.S. charges usually appear to be penetrations of enemy positions which have already lost all power of resistance, i.e. after fire superiority has been gained, and their training in hand-to-hand -hand fighting is not sufficient. Because of this, it is well to consider ways of destroying them by desperate fighting within our defensive positions. So for their part, especially earlier in the war, the Japanese advocated sharpened blades and a whole lot of bonsai. They even put bayonets on their machine guns. GIs spent many more hours on various rifle ranges than on the bayonet course, but uh, sometimes the enemy forced the issue. Bayonets will be fixed for the final assault, yes, but when we think of killing, we must think of bullets fired at point-blank range. The bayonet is the final threat and the last reserve. It may be used in emergency, but precious few enemy soldiers survive long enough to be killed with a bayonet. Once the assault had begun, there were only so many possible outcomes. The assault was beaten back or the assault succeeded. It could succeed in a few ways, by wiping the enemy out, by forcing the enemy to withdraw, or compelling the enemy to surrender. Usually if there was enough time, the enemy would withdraw, but if they were about to be overrun, then they would surrender. Or in the wildest circumstances, a swirling bayonet melee, with the victor emerging when the dust settled. Again, this was generally avoided. While it was possible for even extended firefights to result in relatively few casualties depending on how the day was going, bayonet duels could very quickly result in death. You were suddenly down to 50-50 odds, and who is that confident with a bayonet? Uh, most soldiers on the Western Front would rather live to fight another day than chance cold steel while grappling nose to nose. If the assault failed, or the squad could not gain or maintain fire superiority, they may have been required to withdraw, uh, which was conducted in the same manner as normal fire and movement, only headed the wrong way. In a withdrawal, the squad supports one team with another from successive locations until disengagement is effected. Following a successful attack, the squad needed to reorganize. The rest of the squad moved up and the squad leader placed men in the best position to cover the reorganization. Pursuing the enemy by fire only, and if not immediately attacking another objective, preparing to defend against hostile counterattack. As a matter of SOP training, automatic rifle teams and rifle grenadiers of a squad on an exposed flank should observe constantly to the flank and engage promptly any enemy weapons which appear there. Having completed arrangements for protection, each unit proceeds to reorganize. Key men in the platoon or squad such as leaders, assistant leaders, scouts, and automatic riflemen who have become casualties are replaced. Ammunition of casualties is collected and redistributed, and additional ammunition is brought up if practicable. Magazines of the automatic rifles are promptly reloaded. Wounded and prisoners are sent to the rear. Each squad reports to the platoon leader or his assistant the results of reorganization, number and condition of wounded, remaining effective strength, and state of ammunition supply. Soldiers were advised, when the enemy surrenders, make him come to you while you remain behind cover. Do not move from behind cover and go to him. Not only might his surrender be a ruse, but other enemy nearby might be unwilling to surrender and open fire on you. As soon as prisoners are removed to a covered position, they should be searched for concealed weapons. To do this, one captor guards while the other conducts the search. The army provided a handy mnemonic device to use when taking POWs. In handling prisoners, the individual soldier should be taught to remember the four S's. Search, segregate, silence, and speed. That's search them for enemy weapons, segregate them by rank, officers, NCOs, privates. Silence is self-explanatory, keep them from talking. Uh, unless answering a direct question about immediate concerns like local enemy disposition and speed them safely to the rear. Uh, get them off the battlefield and into the hands of trained interrogators as soon as possible. If at all possible, all of this post-assault business was to be carried out someplace other than on the objective that had just been taken. Reorganization is completed rapidly and under cover. There is every reason to expect the enemy to place prepared artillery and mortar fires on his abandoned position. Therefore, the reorganization should take place either in front or in rear of the position. Men must not relax or stand in groups. Their job is not done. As mentioned, the squad, if not immediately continuing the attack, needed to dig in and prepare to defend the position. Uh, the Germans famously tried to retake lost ground like clockwork. Whether it was a good or bad idea, it was always expected they would make the attempt. It is almost an axiom that Jerry will immediately counterattack when he is pushed off a position. He'll come at you, <laughs> machine pistols popping in all directions. He'll probably have mortar and artillery support. Mercifully, for all parties involved, a defensive action is beyond the scope of this video. This has been the basic squad attack your old Uncle Frank was taught in training. And with that, 
you have finally made it to the end. <laughs>